Hello, I'm Dennis Jers. One of my research interests is interactive fiction, and from time to time I get to teach it in the English department at Seton Hill University. Now, the term interactive fiction has been applied to a lot of digital media genres, but in this video I'm using the term specifically to describe command line text parser adventure games. It's a genre dating back to the late 1970s. Now, here's an example Adam Cadre's 905. Uh, originally released in the year 2000. So the phone rings. Oh no, how long have you been asleep? Sure it was a tough night, but this is bad. This is very bad. The phone rings. 905 by Adam Codrey. There's some library information. Bedroom. In bed. This bedroom is extremely spare, with dirty laundry scattered haphazardly all over the floor. Cleaner clothing can be found in the dresser, a bathroom lies to the south, while a door to the east leads to the living room. On the end table are a telephone, a wallet, and some keys. The phone rings. Well, um, in classic text adventure games, the idea is when you see this uh, cursor, or this carrot here, which tells you it's w the computer is waiting for input, uh, the idea is you type brief commands, that tell the computer what you would do if you were the main character. So I think it's pretty obvious what we need to do here. We need to answer the phone. You pick up the phone. Hadley, a shrill voice cries. Hadley, haven't you even left yet? You knew that our presentation was at nine o'clock sharp. First the thing with the printers, now this. There won't even be enough left of you for Bowman to fire once he's done with you. Now get the hell down here. Click. Okay, so, um, obviously what you need to do then is go to work. But we get an error message. And part of the joy, part of the fun, part of the mechanics of interacting with classic text adventure games is you read what the computer has to say about the simulated environment that you're in. You type a command and then you read what the computer says about how your command affected the outside world, and in a throwback to the way computers worked for a long time before the windows and menus and icons and pointer interface, you had to know what command to type. You typed the command, and if the command didn't work, the computer gave you an error message. So this game is giving us an error message saying it's looking for a noun. Well, you, you and I know what it means to go to work, but there's no, there's no noun work in this environment. So go to works makes no sense. Well, we know that uh, from if we type look, look at the room, get that description again, we know that we're in bed. So I could examine bed. And it tells me it's just a regular bed. There's not much uh, to do with it. Uh, I can... Uh, again, I see in this room, well, it says uh, there's a door to the east leading to the living room. So how about I go to the living room? Okay, well, it tells me I have to get out of bed first. How about we try that? All right, get out of bed. Now how about I go to the living room? Okay. Um, now, many interactive fiction games would require you to type a direction like go west or go south, go north. This one happens to recognize the living room. So good on you, Adam Cadre, for putting that detail in this game. Um, so uh, if I want to leave, because I obviously want to go to work, let's uh, go go south out that front door. Okay, front door is closed. Okay, how about I open the door? Which door do I mean? Bedroom door? Well, obviously I want to mean I want to mean the open front door. Open front door. And now how about go through front door? How's that? You need to clear out quickly, true, but you look like an absolute wreck. Going out in this condition and drawing the inevitable bewildered stairs would just be making a bad situation worse. Okay, well, I've already shown you that there's a command uh, look at or examine. How about I examine myself? You're covered with mud and dried sweat. It was an exhausting night. No wonder you overslept. Even making it to the bed before conking out was an heroic accomplishment. So that, uh, even though 
this game so far has uh, how many? Uh, let's see, it was nine oh five when the game started. It's nine fifteen. The, the 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 that time goes up with every uh, one minute, every turn that you take. So I spent ten minutes and I still haven't gotten out of the house. Uh, but that message that said uh, you need to clear out quickly, but you look like an absolute wreck. That contained the hint that I should look at myself. When I look at myself, I get the idea that I'm covered with mud and dried sweat, and I obviously I need to clean myself up. And if you remember from the original description when we were in the uh, bedroom, I'm going to type look to see where I am I'm going to the bedroom to the west. West. In the bedroom, there is a bathroom to the south. And in the south, there is a functional bathroom, sink, toilet, and shower. So the game is hinting that I should clean myself up. Now, I suggest that you play this game yourself. There's actually a link in the description to a version of this game that you can play in your own web browser. And there's also a link to this handy how-to card created by Andrew Plotkin, which gives some, you know, hints and suggestions. And the idea is uh, interactive fiction games have a history and conventions. And the idea is many interactive fiction players, if they've played other games before, they'll know what to do in this game. So this card kind of con just compresses and conceptualize what the average interactive fiction player uh, should be expected to know about these games. It, would help, it will help you get started and help you sort of get out of sort of a beginner's rut. Now, I realize that we are well into the 21st century and computer-generated images are all around us. But text-based computer games ha have been around a lot longer than video games. Now, if we place ourselves back in the late 1970s and really look at what computer graphics were capable of at the time, that I think will give us some context for why text-based computer games were so popular at the time. This is what a mainstream, officially licensed Atari video game looked like in 1979. That blocky thing is Superman. And 10 years later, we have more colors and smaller pixels. But still, the cutting edge for home computer graphics, mainstream computer games look like this. Now, arcade games and, you know, Pac-Man and Space Invaders created engaging experiences with the simple graphics and, you know, bleeping, blooping sound effects. But if you wanted subtlety or depth or immersion, you just didn't have the option of playing games with 3D motion captured performances and fully voiced dialogue sequences. What you did have was text-based interactive fiction. And throughout the 1980s, it was common to see text adventures marketed in bookstores as an intellectual alternative to, you know, mindless button mashing arcade games. Now, 905 is coded in such a way that you have to go through a series of very specific steps, including such mundane details as remembering to take off your watch before you get into the shower. Now, what is the point of all these fiddly details? Well, it's really the equivalent of, you know, killing rats in villagers' uh, basements. It's the dues that you pay early on in the game in order to appreciate how the story progresses. Now, we are playing a game, but I would say that the designer of this game, Adam Cadre, is clearly playing with us. He's created this high-pressure situation because, you know, instead of a score, you can see in the upper right-hand corner, with each turn, a minute passes. So the time is advancing each time we have to do one of these stupid little annoying details. And these little details, I think, are carefully designed to generate in us the same frustration and that sense of rising tension and even panic that our character Hadley, this, you know, this soulless meat popsicle on his way to work to get screamed at, Hadley must be living through these experiences. And that's really what makes this ending so puzzling. When my students find this ending, they often point out that there doesn't really seem to be much payoff. For all that effort that we put into getting ready and leaving the house, what does it just say that we vanished without a trace? What's the con text for that. Anyway, students get the idea that they've done something wrong, and they often try to play the game again. So I'm going to go through 
and play through to get another ending, and um, we'll take it from there. So. Okay, so we've skipped ahead, and um, I've gotten us to uh, Loungent Technologies. I've gotten us in with my the ID card that was in the wallet. Uh, I'm near a cubicle that is marked simply Hadley. So how about I enter the cubicle, and we see a form, a pen, and a note. Well, how about I read note? It tells me, sign the form, return it to me immediately, MB. Okay, well, uh, sign form. I'm not holding a pen. Well, fortunately, there's one right in front of me. Take pen, sign form. I better take that form. I'm going to exit my cubicle. Uh, the, the, the door is to the west, so I'll go to Bauman's office. And you walk into Bauman's office and smiling hand him the signed form. Bauman asks, who the hell are you? The jig is up. You try to make a break for it, but Bauman calls for security, and the guards wrestle you to the ground before you can make it back to the car. Press a key to continue. Okay, so well, what's happened here? There's a little pause in this game. We uh, have to hit the space bar when we finish reading it, and we get the big finish. A burglar broke into an East Las Mesas home, killed the owner, and stashed his body under the bed, put his possessions in the trunk of his car, and then fell asleep. Woke up the next morning, went to his victim's office, and tried to do the victim's job. Here, let's let's restart. And on the very first turn, instead of answering the phone, how about I look under bed? Under the bed, you see the corpse of the guy who owns this house. And if you notice, on that end table, it's a wallet. It's not your wallet. They are some keys. They're not your keys. I'm not in my bedroom. I'm just in bedroom. Let's open that wallet. Look at the driver's license. This is actually pretty clever. Good misdirection here. Driver's license photos are generally far from flattering, and this one is no exception. But this photo looks a lot better than you look now. The phrasing, uh, it's open-ended. It's Obviously, it's not a picture of you. Anyway, there's a lot of clever misdirection in this story. Now, I've spoiled this game for you, of course, but if you play 905 Fresh, you aren't just reading about and empathizing with this person that we think is a cog in the corporate machine. You've, you, you've answered the phone. You've entered into this person's world. You think you are reasonably. You're, you're taking cues from your environment, and you reasonably expect you're supposed to be role-playing uh, 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 Hadley, not Hadley's murderer. Our imagination fills in so many details. Now, when I have students play this game during a class, I, I often hear laughter and sometimes groans and exclamations in ways that I never really hear from students when students are reading, you know, Poe's first-person horror stories. There's something about, you know, being the murderer and not knowing it that surprises people. Now, I think a talented flash fiction writer could deliver a, a disorienting surprise like this, but 905 works in part because of its duration. That is, it's like an extended pun or, or shaggy dog story or earlier like, you know, level grinding by killing rats in people's cellars. Anyway, w there's an extremely long setup that places us, the player, into an environment where we're, you know, following these cues that encourage us to behave in the way that makes the story work. Now, interactive fiction does not have to play with our minds this way, but I have heard from students who confess that when I give them um, a hypertext interactive fiction work, they will just click randomly in order to get to the end of the story. But a text adventure game doesn't work like that. If you don't type the right words, the game won't progress. Now, uh, an interactive fiction game can have, you know, a perfectly conventional story or the thinnest of stories to connect a series of puzzles or, or no narrative story elements at all. And you can explore some of this variety at the Interactive Fiction Database, link in the description, where you can choose games according to tags such as Steampunk or uh, Interpretations of Alice in Wonderland. 
uh, or you can browse for lists such as IF recommended for beginners. Now, the 2021 Interactive Fiction Competition had 71 entries. Many of them are hypertext, but, but a lot of them, are, including the contest winner last year, uh, were these traditional command line text adventure games that have a history going back to the 1970s. Uh, in the early 2000s, the Interactive Fiction Art Show turned up, which invited entries in categories that had nothing to do with story or rules, but instead entries in categories such as landscape and still life and portrait. And in upcoming videos in this series, I'm going to use Inform 7 to uh, explore some of these typical elements of interactive fiction, that is, creating spaces to navigate through the landscapes, props to manipulate the still lifes, and NPCs to interact with and converse with, at least at a very basic level. So anyway, I'm hoping you are enjoying your introduction to interactive fiction, and I hope to uh, stay with you and uh, explore some more Inform 7 with you.